Now, I am a proud, proud Canadian. But one of the things that we do have to deal with quite a bit here in Canada is the snow. And winter in general. And sometimes it's great! Beautiful stuff, isn't it? Unless, of course, you have to walk in it, or bike in it, or drive in it. And what we see a lot of times in winter here are these things. What are they doing? Well, they're dumping salt on the roads. Well, in order to understand how salt melts ice, we first have to understand what salt is, and how we classify salt. And in fact, most of the time when we talk about salt, we talk about this stuff, which is a salt, but it's table salt. It's a class of a compound that we refer to as salts. So even though we say salt, and most people come to think of it as table salt, when we deal with salts, we're really just dealing with uh, ionic compounds that are formed in an acid-base reaction. That is, they're composed of one ion and another ion, and we're going to talk about those ions and where they come from in just a second. Now, ionic compounds are identified by a crystal lattice structure that is formed. And you'll kind of recognize the shape of this, because if you've ever taken a look at a crystal of salt, even table salt, you'll notice that it's kind of a cube shape. Well, funny enough, if we get down small enough and small enough and small enough to the particle level, we'll notice that the structure of salt at the particle level is very similar to the structure at a macroscopic level that we can actually see and taste and touch. And this crystal lattice is composed of a couple of ions, the chloride ion and the sodium ion. So you may even be familiar with table salt as being called sodium chloride. And it, because it comes from the sodium ions and the chloride ions that are in there. Now the sodium chloride, the NaCl, again another formula that you may recognize as being common table salt, gives us a one-to-one -one ratio, NaCl. And all it has to do with, really, is the ratio of sodium ions to chloride ions in that crystal lattice structure. And that NaCl we refer to as a formula unit. So a formula unit of an ionic compound would be analogous to what we call a molecule if it is a molecular compound. Now, ionic compounds have uh, some pretty general characteristics. They form crystals, as we can see from their crystal lattice structure. They're generally brittle, so if you were to, say, hit them or crush them with a hammer, they're going to shatter. And they conduct electricity in solution, so that's usually why it's not a good idea to have electrical appliances in the shower or in the bath, because all of the salts, the ions that are on your body, they can make water conductive, not to mention the ions that are probably already in your bath water, and they have relatively high melting points and boiling points. Now, in illustrating ionic bonds and how they form using our Lewis structures, we have to keep in mind that this is involving a transfer of electrons. And we have to take a look at the periodic table again to remember why this transfer occurs. We have metals on the left and we have non-metals on the right. Now, metals show a tendency to lose or donate electrons, whereas non-metals show a tendency to gain electrons. And all you have to do is think about how close they are to those noble gases. Non-metals have a, usually a higher number of electrons, and metals have a lower number of electrons in their valent shells. So metals are going to become isoelectronic with the noble gases by losing a couple of electrons, and the nonmetals are going to become isoelectronic with the noble gases by gaining a couple of electrons. And what happens is that metals, since they lose electrons, now have more protons, more positive charge than they do negative charge, and they become positively charged cations. And the nonmetals gaining electrons now have an overall negative charge because they have more electrons, more negatively charged particles than they do protons, they become negatively charged anions. And these opposite charges attract, and that's what forms our ionic bond. So let's say we have calcium bonding with chlorine. Well, calcium being group 2 is going to have two valence electrons around it, and chlorine being group 7 is going to have seven valence electrons around it. So each chlorine needs to gain one electron. But if you notice, calcium has two to donate. So we are going to need two chlorines here to form this compound. Now, in illustrating this, we're going to show the transfer of the electrons from the calcium to the chlorine, and then we're going to go into another step and draw the Lewis structure for this particular compound. Now notice that since calcium has lost or donated two electrons, it's going to become a positively charged cation. We're going to put square brackets around it by convention and put a 2 plus. And notice that it's a 2 plus, not a plus 2. Ionic charges have the magnitude of the charge in front and the positive or negative after. 
And if we take a look at each chlorine, each chlorine has gained one electron, so it becomes a negatively charged anion with a one negative charge. And we don't have to indicate the one, we're just going to put the negative there. Now, again, by convention, the way that we draw these and the way that it's accepted is that the anion, the negatively charged ion, is going to have a full complement of electrons around it. The cation has no electrons around it. And I've drawn it in alternating because we have a negative charge, positive charge, negative charge, but if you want to condense it a little bit, and this is something I allow my students to do, I will allow them to put a 2 in front, not as a subscript, but in front of the chlorine to indicate that there's one calcium ion and two chloride ions here in bonding. And that's how we go through and represent ionic compounds using Lewis structures. Okay, back to original question. Why does salt melt ice? Well, before we can answer that, again, we have to take a look at ice itself. You see, water as a liquid is constantly in motion, and it's moving around, and it's overcoming the attractive force of the water molecules for each other just within the motion of those particles. But as the temperature decreases, what we start to see is that these water molecules start to form into an ordered structure, very much like a crystal lattice structure. And so it forms a slippery crystal surface that the cars obviously slide along. Now, the salt comes in and disrupts this attraction between the neighboring water molecules so that it takes a lower and lower and lower energy, the more the salt is added, for these particles to actually come together and create solid ice. Now, we don't actually use sodium chloride in the roads all that often. What we use is calcium chloride, because if you notice, sodium chloride in a one-to-one -one ratio between sodium ions and chloride ions can disrupt some of the bonds, but if we take a look at calcium chloride, calcium chloride has a one-to-two ratio between the calcium and the chloride ions, so we have one and a half times more ions able to disrupt the attractive force of those water molecules and disrupt the crystal structure that they make. So it's actually more effective to use a different salt, and we still do call it a salt, when we deal with melting ice. Now it should be noted that even in very high concentrations, this only works to about minus 20 degrees Celsius, which means if we get any colder than that, and in Canada we can get colder than that, well we have to put sand on there to provide some grit as well, because if we put salt on roads that are under minus 20 degrees Celsius, it's not really going to do much. So we do need that grit to help us out. So hopefully this vodcast has helped you understand a little bit more about ionic structures and why it is we, in those places that have ice on the roads, have to put salt on. Thanks for watching.